All right, so we're getting pretty close on time here. I want to respect everybody's time. Um, and so we okay getting started. We might have some stragglers coming in. There's some information up here, a little sign-in sheet, um, and just stuff I put together over time as well as my card. But I want to thank everybody for coming. My name is Dr. Michael Derry. I am an orthopedic specialist in the area. I have my doctorate in physical therapy. And then I went on and got my board uh, certification in orthopedics. So I did a, a residency after school and I treat orthopedic conditions all day, every day. That's what I do. I provide one-on-one -on -one care in people's homes or workplaces or gyms to kind of get them the results that they're looking for. And I specialize in arthritic degenerative conditions as well as back pain and just general spine pain. Um, but also don't shy away from other orthopedic issues as well, um, post-operative and non-operative. But I do love treating conservatively. And so I lean more towards that. And you're going to see some of that in today's presentation. But um, I want to thank everybody for coming and today I wanted to talk about you know, like how to stay active now and live longer despite lower back arthritis and degeneration and I know that's something that's probably not unfamiliar to many people in this room, um, especially those last two words, arthritis and degeneration. Hi, welcome. Hi. Come on in. And there's a sign in right here uh, and you can have a seat anywhere you would like. I'm going to adjust one little thing. And make sure I turn. There we go. And so I'm very passionate about moving people from vulnerability and frailty and moving them more towards resiliency. So resiliency is like how much can you do before you feel discomfort or pain in this case. And so classic example would be I'm going to avoid working in my yard as long as I want to work because I'm afraid of how my body is going to feel afterwards, right? That's just one example, but that's one that I treat a lot. And that's one that I work with, work through with clients and how to move them more towards that lifestyle that they want, despite all of this stuff going on. Because unfortunately over time we develop a lot of these things, arthritis and degeneration, and we're not super good at treating them, especially in the spine. Right. Over the years, we've had many, many technological advances and medical advances, but we're still not very good at treating it. And it's because we were stuck in this model that I'm going to go over with you guys today. And so again, a little bit about myself. I spoke to that a little bit earlier, but my passion um, is I really just like reframing the way people think about their body and discomforts that they're experiencing, as well as maybe some pathologies they've been told that they have ranging from arthritis and degeneration. Um, but this can also include disc bulges, disc herniations, bone on bone, um, any other words that you guys can think of for arthritis and degeneration that you've heard. Arthritis and degeneration are in interchangeable, right? They're, they're, they're the exact same thing. Arthritis is changes in joint with inflammation. Degeneration means you've been on this earth for a few revolutions. Right? That's kind of what it means. And so how do we implement this evidence-based care? We have a lot of good research out there because we have many aging older adults and they're well studied, but how do we implement the research with what we're actually seeing in the clinic? That is also another passion of mine. I like bridging that gap. I'm very much um, leaning towards interventions that have evidence support. And then how do I empower and encourage people to move towards the directions that they want to move and guide them along the way and kind of be aware of maybe some stuff that may come along, like doctor's visits or aches and pains, explaining what's causing some of that and help predicting that future. And I also enjoy my fair share of coffee. I love going to local coffee shops. I'm in the car a lot and I drive to people's homes. And so I love stopping at Kookaburra, Brass Tacks, like these local coffee shops. And so uh, I do enjoy some coffee. And that picture on the right is me working with in someone in their home, working on some thoracic and lumbar mobility. And so today, I think if you break down the objectives, we can know more and then we can do more. So if we can know a little bit more about our body and what to predict, then we're not as fearful about doing more, right? If we can be really good at predicting our body, that's a really good thing. So knowing that what your limits are and maybe how you're going to respond is going to help you stay away from surgical and more risky interventions and lean more towards maybe that morning routine that you do or that exercise class that you do to help keep your body resilient and less vulnerable. 
And so I want to go over arthritis and degeneration, what they actually are, maybe what the medical system can offer you for both of those things, and maybe where, we're, where we need to fill the gaps between treating pain and treating a person. And I feel like sometimes when you go to a doctor's visit, you're treated more like someone with a body part rather than an individual that's having difficulties in certain areas, despite this stuff going on arthritis, degeneration, herniations, bone on bone, etc. And so if we can know a little bit more, then we're a little more confident doing more. And so motion is lotion for your body. The more you move, the better you feel. I think everybody can attest to that. So in the morning, sometimes you can feel rather stiff or after you've been sitting for an extended period of time, but after you get up and let's say work out the kinks, you feel a little bit better. And then honestly, the general recommendations that have been proven to help you live longer and more functional lives. Hi there. No, no problem. And so I will say that there is a disclaimer. So everything I'm telling, talking to you guys about today is evidence-based. And so there is literature to support it. I'll have references at the end. But I lean, I lean heavily towards conservative measures, not only because I'm a physical therapist, but I feel like that's where people should start. That's why they're there. And that's why they should be recommended early on in your care. And I have quite a bit of evidence to show that as well. But I really want to transition people away from paternalistic care, so being told what to do based off your body and being a part of like that therapeutic alliance or that joint decision making about making decisions that are best for your body and how it presents that is unique to every person. And so there isn't one specific pathway that fits everybody. And I think we can all say that we know people with back pain and some people who do very well and some people who do very poorly with the same interventions, let's say a, a back surgery. Right? Some people, oh man, mine, went, mine was awesome, and other people are like, mine was not as good. Same surgery, but that's the difference between treating pain and treating the person. Oh, and feel free to ask any questions throughout. I want to keep this very casual. I love the small group, and any questions is great. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's your choice if you want to disclose any personal information. I will ask you maybe to shy away from that, but I'm very open to questions. I feel like the more that you guys can ask, the more that you will get out of it. And so any point in time, don't be afraid to just interrupt me. I, I appreciate that. So what you need to know about arthritis and degeneration. So like I said, they're interchangeable. Arthritis is changes in your joints with some inflammation that happens over time. And degeneration is the same thing, right? It's, we've heard of disc degeneration. That's a very common term. It means that the disc is getting smaller over time. Those little... Um, like fibrous and water-filled tissues that help support your back with different movements, and those become smaller over time. That's why you lose an inch to an inch and a half as you get older. Combine that with a little bit of osteopenia, a little osteoporosis, you lose a little bit more height. Very normal. I wouldn't get stuck worrying about that. Now, it's not great that you're losing some height, but it just happens over time. It's very, very normal. And then how do we transition people to understand that aging just means that you're aging. It doesn't mean that you're becoming weaker. <coughs> Orin, hi there. Pain. For pain, all kinds of it, yep. I'm giving a bunch of pain away today. <laughs> Sorry, I'm No, no, you're okay, you're okay. Here, let me help you out. Um, no, 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 here. I got a chair right here. It's also one right here if you want it. And so I'm not ageist, right? We're all aging adults. And so I'm, we can't be ageist to our older selves. And so old but not weak. Those things are not the exact same thing. And I feel like some, some, some things in our current system kind of promote that. Tell you to avoid certain things because of certain things in your environment or tell you not to bend over and pick heavier weights because you're frail or fragile or something bad could happen. Well, let's, let's prove that. Like, like, that's just not a generic blanket statement. Now, some conditions do require some closer eyes, but not all of them. So like, let's find what specifically works for you. I have individuals across the age span into the early 90s lifting 40, 50 pounds, and even in the 30s, right? It's, it's the same benefit in your body. We have to build strong, resilient people because we want to live long and die fast, right? We want to be strong and resilient. And then when our time comes, it comes, comes quick. When you guys live in Del Webb. You want to stay active and healthy your entire life, right? And so I just want to help promote that. So arthritis and degeneration, what does that actually feel like? Anybody? Like hurts, right? Classic just pain. 
Achy is a common term, right? Stiff. Stiff, right? That's the other common term as well. Any others? You get out of bed and you just can't walk. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. You feel the What's that? You feel the okay, I haven't heard that one before. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of crawling along, a little hitch in the giddy up. Um, you know, feel like you just need to get some oil in your body and your joints, and then that's just telling. Those are just all the tiny joints in your back and your hips and your knees, just telling you. You haven't been moving in a while. So arthritis is inflammatory in nature. That's why it has itis at the end of it. So you have this tiny bit of inflammation through many, many joints in your body. Well, when that inflammation sits in there, that's what you feel. The stiffness, the achiness, the radiating discomfort. You don't feel like you are as limber as you used to be and getting up and standing upright can be a little bit more challenging. And those are just your joints filled with a little bit of that, what I call inflammatory soup. And that's why when you move, you feel better after working some of that stuff out. And so it makes sense. Your body's a pump, and so it's pumping that fluid in and out. So that arthritis and degeneration very much feels like that. Stiffness, achiness, achy discomfort, pressure changes in the air is another common one. If it's raining, you can tell if the rain's coming. And if you haven't moved for a while, like the five-hour car trip is a little bit more difficult than it used to be a few years ago. Those are all very common signs. But we shouldn't be afraid of that because that is a very common sign of being on this earth, rather be on this earth and not be on this earth. And so people are often looking for quick fixes for some of that. And there are some tips and tricks out there, but we'll learn that maybe why those quick fixes don't necessarily work as well for everybody. Is arthritis hereditary? There is some um, hereditary component to it, um, but not all. It's, it's, it's kind of like throwing a dart at the wall, but sometimes that dartboard is a little bit bigger and sometimes it's a little bit smaller, just depending on many factors. What's more important is to think about, like if you've had a significant injury in one area of your body or surgery, you're more prone to arthritis. So like people have had ACL reconstructions in the past, they're more prone to knee ar arthritis. Or people have had surgery, they're more prone to arthritis in other joints of their body that are close to that surgical site because you're having more motion in some areas and less motion in others. You actually have a more chance of arthritis from what I call, what you'll see is modifiable factors. And so how's your diet? How often do you move? Um, um, what's, your, what's your weight been like your entire life? Like that type of thing. Do you have a hard laborious job? Like those things have a higher impact on arthritis prediction than necessary um, hereditary. Um, so this is a really good chart. So this was a study done a few years ago uh, and it was MRIs on everybody, right? I don't necessarily like that because it's very costly, but they did MRIs on a bunch of people, hundreds of people without pain. So MRIs on people without pain across the lifespan. So the bottom axis that you can see the twenties and all the way up is your age. So you can find where you are in the graph. Most of you are down here, right? Twenties and thirties. And so you could see up here, and I know this can be a little hard to read, but you can see over time as you approach later in life, your chances of having facet degeneration with their small joints in your back. Well, we just learned that's another word for arthritis, disc height loss, same thing, right? You can see your percentage of chance of having what we call those pathologies over time. And so let's see where you're at. You can go up and these are all individuals without pain. Every one of these people in this study were with, without discomfort. And this has been proven over and over again. And so that's really interesting to see that you have all of this pathology or all of these findings and you don't have any pain. And, I, and most people's next question is why? Like, what do they do differently than me? Why don't they have pain? And that's a very good question. And, and what's really interesting is if you look at those individuals who don't have pain, there's a few things that we can learn from them. And we're gonna go over some of that. Any questions from that? I can't read. What, yeah. what does the blue line mean? So the very bottom blue line is a facet degeneration. So the tiny joints in your back. Okay. Yep. So then orange is what? Uh, the one just above it is disc height loss, okay. and then disc bulging, and then disc degeneration. So basically, if you're 60 and above, right. you're going to have all of this stuff. Even, even when you're in your 20s and 30s, you're going to have a mild amount of all of this stuff. 
And these changes over time are very normal. And what's happened in our traditional medical system is that we've, we've made these the villain because it's very easy to treat the villain with medication, surgery, and say that we're going to treat it, but we're not actually needing to treat these things if we just had a better understanding of our body and our lifestyle and just had a better understanding of like, maybe what do I need to do every day to give my body some TLC? Now, across the hall, you guys are doing awesome things, giving your body some TLC. That's amazing. It's been shown to help you live longer, stronger, functional lives. And where I come in is I say, okay, so if we know that exercise is relatively good for us, there's no one who would say that exercise is bad for us. Does anybody believe that there's exercise bad for us? Now, some of us can think that exercise can maybe be harmful to some of the things that we have going on. So like if we have significant discomfort, it's a little harder to convince me that exercise isn't necessarily gonna hurt me. But that's where I come in is we figure it out despite that stuff. Because if we go down the route of treating what is normal, then it's hard to get out of that, right? One surgery leads to another surgery, to more medication, et cetera, et cetera. That's how we got, that's how we got behind on the opioid pro crisis. That's why we have all these orthopedic surgeries, but yet these conditions still exist. Right? If, we had a, if we had something that actually worked, everybody would get it, and then we wouldn't have that problem anymore. So we're still dealing with this, and this isn't pathology. This is normal aging. Pathology is something that's, that, is, that we think is harmful, and normal aging is something that, that we kind of look forward to. Like we want to live healthier, we would have longevity and avoid frailty. So how we do it is have a better understanding of what's going on. And what I dislike is when people have x-rays and MRIs and it shows everything on there because it's, it's normal, right? It's normal to have those things on there. But then that provider, whoever did that, doesn't explain that, right? Because if I had an x-ray and MRI that showed everything on there, what am I going to do next? I'm going to jump on Google for sure. And I'm going to basically, I'm going to basically figure out when I'm going to die from all of this stuff, right? That's not right because then what you're seeing on Google is just paid advertisements from people that pay a bunch of money to show that their treatments for that stuff. Advil, Tylenol, organizations have a lot more money than I do and you do, right? But that's what you see first. And that leads us down a pathway of more medical treatment and the healthcare system loves that, but our healthcare system is stressed, right? Very much, that's why everybody's premiums are going up, deductibles are going up, it's getting a lot more costly. Yeah, spondylosis, yeah, it's just an arthritic term for your back. And you can have it in many areas. That's right, L1, L2, L3, L4, right? We've all seen that. It's very normal, very, very normal. Okay, and so I was kind of hinting at it before, but we have what we've been in before, which is the biomedical model. The biomedical model was the things that we just saw and we do take a picture of somebody and we say, you have facet degeneration. Your choices are medication and injections to help treat that. I'm making a gross generalization, but this is what I see most of the time. That's a biomedical model in that we treat your body like a car. It has a bad alternator. Let's treat the alternator and then you're going to feel better. Well, that's not working. We're seeing that that's not working over and over and over again. Now, a caveat to that is like I've treated many, many joint replacements and many, many people do very well after joint replacements because they're a good candidate for that. And if you are at the right point in time and have the right symptoms and if you're a good candidate, then, then the outcomes are really good. I'm not saying that those surgical interventions are not warranted, but I think we're doing too many of them to not the right people at the right time. So low value care is a traditional medical model that leads you more towards more in images so classic example is going to your ortho appointment and getting an x-ray before you even see anybody. Has that happened to anybody or know anybody, right? Yeah, so, yeah. And so if you look at the American College of Radiology guidelines for care, guideline-based care means highest evidence that most people should follow generally, you shouldn't have an imaging because that leads to higher incidences of surgery and injections because it's going to show you these pathologies and they're going to want to treat them with that because they want to do something for you that when, when you're there and you're kind of going in there expecting that anyways that you're going to see a surgeon and so low value care leads to higher costs and the outcomes are just not as good because that's can't that can't be a place where we start that uh, did i say high value or low value i meant that for low value okay so high value care is when we when we look at the evidence in the person and we try to start conservatively first. 
And so conservatively means nothing that's gonna be given to you to ingest in your body or poked with a needle in some sort of solution in there or surgery. Guidelines, American College of Radiology, the, the guidelines for emergency medicine and the guidelines for primary care providers, the guidelines for physical therapists all say that conservative care is the best place to start and that you shouldn't have any imaging, x-rays or MRIs, without progressive neurological loss, trauma, um, not responding to conservative care after weeks of trying it. But for general aches and pains and stuff, like you should avoid imaging because that's gonna show you all of the stuff that we talked about and it has a higher chance of receiving a riskier intervention. There is no risk in conservative care. Conservative care is PT, massage, Cairo. The only risk is your time. And I know time is valuable, but I'd much rather try something that could work not only now, but I can learn things in the future that's gonna help decrease my cost of healthcare dollars, but also the system and lead to better outcomes. Outcomes being less pain and disability. So you feel better and you're able to do more and you're not as reliant on the healthcare system to make you better. You are in more control of your health and, you're no, and you learn so much about your body that you know how the future is gonna go. Like that sounds like a better, better package deal for me than receiving images or having um, care that may not be appropriate for me at that time. But unfortunately, there's a lot of bias and a lot of drivers in our healthcare system because that one pathway makes people a lot more money than the other pathway. And that's just the way it is. So you have, two, you have two situations. The biomedical model, which is one I talk about where they treat your body like a car. You just go in and replace parts, put some new oil in there, here and there, but thinking that it's going to have that outcome that you're looking for. And it does for some, but for most, it, ne it doesn't necessarily always happen. And then we have the other model, which is the kind of the place that we should start. And we're seeing a lot more evidence go there. And we're seeing a lot more um, organizations starting to support that as well. That's why some people's insurances limit you from getting an MRI. Have you ever heard that? Like, oh, I can't get an MRI until I have received conservative care. Well, I know that can seem like a booger initially because they're like, man, I want the MRI. I want to know what's going on. But they're actually pointing you in a direction that's better conservatively for you. Now, it may not be what we want, right? That's different than between what we want and what we actually need. Um, but those are questions that I ask, that I answer every day. Like, Michael, do I need an MRI? Okay, well, like, let's look at your situation and look at what's going on kind of throw in some evidence and throw in what you're having problem in your life and figure out the best solution for you. I recommend MRIs before. I'm not completely against them. And that's just one example, but we have to do the, we have to do the right treatment to the right person at the right time. So treating the pain versus treating the person. So I'd like to use imaging as an example because it's, it's easy, but a picture says a thousand words. And if you give your MRI or x-ray to 10 different radiologists, they will show up with 10 different things because you can't see pain. You just can't see it. You can see an MRI that's awful, but no one has pain or like that study that we showed, right? Or an MRI or an x-ray that's like, man, it's like maybe mild stuff here, maybe a little spondylosis, but mm, it's hard to say when well, you're like, well, that doesn't make sense. I'm hurting. Or if they're like, oh man, you sure you don't have any pain here? Because we see a lot of changes there. You're like, no, I don't have any pain there. It's up here. Pain is tricky, right? And that's what makes pain versus the person very different. Pain is an experience that's driven by what's uh, the pain receptors in your body and your brain. Everything's interpreted in our brain. So I bring up the minor cut example in that if you've ever been working in your yard or a project or something like that, you're, you know, you're sweaty, you're, you're just doing what you need to do. And then later on that day, you go to take a shower and you feel a little burn on your leg. You look down and you have a cut. Well, that cut's been there for three, four hours, but your body didn't recognize it as harmful until, until you got in the shower and then it started burning. But at that time, your body didn't recognize it as harmful. And that's actually cut to your skin. Like there's a bunch of pain receptors there, but why didn't you have pain when that happened? Also, why didn't those people in that study that had all of those changes in their back and their body didn't have pain? Why didn't they have pain? because pain is an experience and it's an interpretation of your, of your environment and the beliefs that you have and the, the society that we're in and how you were raised. All of these factors determine about your pain. And so the, the point to drive home here is that pain is very different than pathology. You can see all these changes, but it doesn't mean that's what you're feeling. And you can feel awful, but not have a lot of changes. There's this disconnect. And it isn't linear of as we age, we have more pain. Like that isn't linear. 
Um, I would say that you're going to be a little stiffer than maybe you were before, maybe a little harder to lose weight, a little harder to gain strength, your body's not quite as fast as it used to be. Well, sure, absolutely. But pain's not on that scale, not at all. So when I work with individuals and we want to improve their pain and they have stiffness, they have spondylosis, they have facet, they have disc herniations, they have bone on bone, then I look at your body, right? Because you're not just a body part. What other things do you have, like cards, like they say, like cards stacked in your favor? So like how active are you are, how, how active are you, how's your diet, how's your sleep, how's, um, how many steps are you getting in a day, how strong are you? Like all of those things impact how you feel. Does that make sense? Anybody, any questions? So far I'm doing a lot of talking. I'm supposed to do a lot of talking, but like, you guys thinking. Has anybody um, kind of been down that path before that I was talking about before of like the traditional medical model? And, and there's no fault to be had at all, but there can be frustrations in that past model because you're not necessarily learning more about your body. Um, and some treatments may have worked for you and some treatments may have not, but there's like this ambiguity to it. I've treated it for years and I've done it. Yeah, you've had it. Mm -hmm. And I'm very much aware of uh, what the current uh, medical profession mm -hmm. industry is mm -hmm. like in this country now. It's much different than it used to be. Mm -hmm. and it's becoming more and more uh, consolidated in terms of thinking mm -hmm. and very narrow-minded and forcing these um, high profitability yep. sorts of treatments. And to hear in particular... A, a younger medical professional speaking uh, mm -hmm. independently like yeah. this is really encouraging. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, I feel like people are starting to feel it more and more and see it more and more. Um, you know, they've done really cool studies where they've been able to reduce a ton of cost to the healthcare system. Um, but unfortunately, like those same pathways don't necessarily produce a bunch of money for the hospital or the organization doing it. And so, like there is, there is a way to do both, right? There is, we can provide really good care and that's gonna make people come back and get better and know more about their body. And then that recommends, like there's lots of ways to do it. Um, but I just think we've, we've gotten this rut to um, not really, it's like a fee for service model, right? You have X done, you're paid if they get better or not. And I feel like there should be some level of accountability. Now I know that'd make my life harder, I'd have to prove my outcomes and I would make sure you're getting better and get the best treatment possible. But who does that benefit? That benefits the person, right? We, should, we got in this to get people better. And so I think, I think everybody should be held more accountable. And the guideline-based care I was talking about, no one holds people accountable to that. Not a single person, yeah. I think one of the problems is if you follow sports or anything like mm -hmm. that, one little thing goes wrong with one of these high-paid athletes. The second thing, the second you read about it, they went and got an MRI right yeah. away, and famous sports doctor, so and so, yeah. is looking at the MRI and they're treating the person. So if you go to a, I'll say regular doctor yeah. or whatever, you feel like, well, how come am I not as good? As yeah, yeah, as yeah. A sports guy. Yeah. Because I'm getting this other thing, and I'm like, huh? Yeah. Why aren't they doing that for me? Yeah, I, yeah, you know, that NFL team has millions of dollar backing that person being healthy and being able to produce. And so that that pathway, while not as evidence supported, and that's hands down, um, they get that because of how much money is involved. And like example is the ACL tear, right? We see that person like Adrian Peterson is a good example. He had an ACL tear, had surgery right away and got right into rehab. Well, there's been shown that some people can live their lives without ACLs. I don't, yeah, yeah, you, you don't need them. Um, if you're not doing high level cutting and sprinting, you could still get back to it. And so like there's this disconnect. And what they also don't show you is that those athletes take very good care of their body. Like their body is the way they make money. They're, so they're eating well, they're sleeping well, their diet's on point and they're, work, they're working it. And so they've stacked a lot of cards in their favor to have a great outcome. And they're in their early 30s, late 20s. Okay, so it just makes things a little bit different. So it's not apples to apples, but I get what you're saying and that you expect this type of care because that's what there is to offer. I want the imaging. I want the best of the best. You may not need the best of this. That's a, another point that I, I, it's a sore point for me in, in the medical field is very rarely do they approach uh, care from a holistic perspective. Mm. 
I mean, there's a lot of truth to we are what we eat, for example. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And with regards to uh, something like rheumatism and inflammation, yep. that's very critical, and yet top doctors won't even mm. won't even entertain the discussion. No. It's all about, you know, they, they'll just as soon have you inject, uh, ingest an RX than they would uh, a healthy food. Because yeah. they don't even know uh, what yeah. healthy foods are and for, for the ailment that they specialize in. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, it's a lot easier to prescribe medication than have a tough conversation. Yeah, sure. And uh, people would rather take a pill than go on a diet, really. Yeah. Nobody, it's yeah. Makes money on, I yeah. Yeah. I mean, you guys know this more than most, but health is hard. Like to have good health is hard. And it's not it's not for the weak and it's not for the people not willing to put time in their body. What I appreciate is when I have the time to sit down with patients just like this. My visits are an hour long. And like you need that repetitiveness and accountability to make change. If you tell like hey, like Mrs. anybody's last name Jones in here? No. No, okay. Mrs. Jones like yeah, you do have some knee pain or back pain, um, but you also have a lot of other things that can impact your pain. And instead of medication injections, which I'm not saying you're not a candidate for, let's let's modify this other stuff to calm down your systemic inflammation, get you moving more, get you feeling better, and then let's let's circle back to this more riskier stuff if you need it. Like that's a lot harder conversation than saying, Mrs. Jones, you have this change in your back, I want you to go see my buddy Ortho at Southeast Orthopedics. Like what, what that pathway is going to be very different. And I'm not saying one's um, necessarily better for that person, but as a general rule and a place that we should start, one is a better place to start. So that's what I love doing. Like I have those tough conversations. I look at their body. I look at other cards that they've stacked in their favor. And we look at improving the individual and not just the body part. And that's, it's more work. It's definitely more work, but I love doing it because the outcomes are so much better. And that's why I stepped away from my previous health job at a big healthcare system because I wasn't able to treat the, the way the evidence was necessarily pointing in that direction. We, well, we, yeah, we just need to be aware of what the literature is showing. And it doesn't apply to everybody. There are limitations, of course, mm -hmm. but it's a good place to start. Now, there's a lot of things that aren't evidence-supported that work. Right, and that's still emerging. We're still studying, so I, I, I also don't, try not to swing to the other side of the fence. I love bringing up this chart. I know it's gonna be really hard to see, so I'll go over it. But when we look at aging successfully and being less vulnerable and stronger and et cetera, et cetera, there's really good evidence to say if you do X, you will hands down live longer. We know that you live longer when you have more lean muscle mass when I'm talking about exercise in general. Like I'm a physical therapist, so I'm gonna lean more to, I'm gonna lean towards that. But lean muscle mass and, and what's called sarcopenia will will things tank fast. That's why when people go in, you can see people go in the hospital, they lose a bunch of weight, and then they try to go home after not moving. This movement, this movement that they're recommending in here will help you keep lean muscle mass and helps you add years to your life. So lean muscle mass is just muscle, right? We have to earn that a little bit. You're still very capable of, ga of gaining muscle, um, muscle mass, but the more muscle mass it has, the longer you live because you're more resilient. And so um, sarcopenia is a general loss of muscle mass as we age. It gets harder and harder, it does, um, and, we, and we lose a little bit of weight. We don't have quite as much muscle, maybe a little more adipose than we used to have, um, but the more lean muscle mass, the better. Now. Lean muscle mass is not the entire story. We need to work on our heart as well, and we need to work on our balance, right? Balance our fear for uh, falls becomes a little bit greater as we get older than it does when we're younger because um, we have this innate thought of uh, if we fall, what happens then? Am I going to break a bone? Am I going to be able to get up? Like those are, those are really scary things, and we don't want that to happen. And so to live longer, more functional life, lives and what i do when i work with people that are wanting that and they're knowing and they're willing to put in the work and we know that we're going to end there and then we improve your discomfort first and then we get there because to get to say that we need to do that but you're like you know it hurts every time i do that well let's improve that first right we need to start there but no this is our end game so we're looking at three to four days a week of really taking care of our body 20 to 30 minutes of resistance training um, and some cardiovascular work that can range from high intensity interval training, right? I'm not ageist. So you can still get your heart rate up and work hard because it takes less time. It's less, it's less time commitment. Everybody loves less time commitment, but that means you're going to have to work a little harder in that time. 
And that doesn't matter. That's not biased if, uh, if you have joint replacements or X, Y, Z. That's to live longer as a human being. Okay, so we know that we need to get there. So every, at three to four times a week, we're resistance training. So we're picking up some weights. We're lifting some bands because that builds lean muscle mass. Everybody can agree that lean muscle mass is good to have because you want to feel stronger and more resilient. Now, it's fun. It's a ton of fun. It doesn't really matter what it is. Band work, lifting weights, CrossFit, um, chair exercises. Like you just need to build mass and you have to have some sort of external resistance. Your body weight is a great place to start. Amazing place to start because you learn how to do things, learn the exercises, but then once it becomes a certain point, you have to have external resistance. I had an 83 year old just yesterday picking up heavyweights and lots of arthritis riddled with it. And that's okay. And it responds very well, but we'd be safe about it, right? I would never have someone do that without some education. Education is so important. So resistance training, and then we move on to cardiovascular health. So you need a certain amount of minutes every week, 75 to 150 minutes of aerobic strengthening. Your heart's a muscle, so I say aerobic strengthening. Um, and that can be even lower if you do high intensity. And so walking, uh, jogging, playing pickleball, swimming, exercise class, a dance class, working your heart, your one and only heart to pump everything through your body. You have to work your heart, you have to strengthen your muscles, and you need to do some sort of balance training as well. Perturbations, and by I mean like just external resistance, close, everybody notice like when you close your eyes, you, you lose your balance pretty quickly. Um, and then you just work on the systems of your of, of balance to improve your eyes, the sensory receptors in our feet, etc. So that's the end goal goal, not necessarily because I love doing that stuff, but that's what the evidence says to live longer and more functional lives. So I would be doing some of a disservice if I didn't actually include some of that, or at least have conversations around that. So improve pain, improve how you feel, and get you lo living longer and more functional lives. And that's the same, same treatment for people who have neck pain, back pain, hip pain, hip replacements, joint replacements, etc. Any questions on that? I know it's hard to read, but they give examples like dancing, cycling, Tai, tai Chi, etc. This is not PT research. This is international classifications of aging adults or something like that. So the key would be hitting some of that. And when we look at blue zones, people who tend to live more centennials, right? People who can live to 100, like what are they doing? What are these people doing to live longer? Like they're definitely not, not moving. Like they are all moving. They walk where they need to go. They, they take care of their body because we only get one. Questions? I was just reading a book called The Blue Zone Cookbook. Oh, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, yeah, I've seen it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just love, I love pulling these little tits and uh, tidbits from everywhere, right? And so what I learned in school is very limited because there's this lag between research and what you're tested on and your boards and stuff. So like you learn more and like the residency training and stuff, but how do we learn from these different groups of people that do very well? You know, I think it's interesting. Okay, so I want to do a little demonstration. Everybody's like, yeah, great. Anybody... And people are like, you just talked about stiffness, but you've had me sitting for 40 minutes, and so I'm feeling a little stiff. Anybody um, want to volunteer for a little demonstration about low back mobility? Just a couple exercises that I like to use to help improve stiffness in the lower back, particularly. Volunteer. Awesome. So this is my table. This is what I bring to everybody's home. I'll do anything. There's nothing, and if anybody needs to stand up and take a break, please, like, motion is lotion, right? Um, you can go ahead and lay down on your back. Are you comfortable laying on your back? No, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So usually it feels a little better when your knees are bent and your feet are flat. You comfortable? Sure. So mobility work is different than stretching. So mobility is joint movement to help improve just like a little bit of fluid movement in and out, right? Because arthritis and degeneration is that little... Uh, stagnant inflammatory soup in your joints and you want to move it out because you feel better. Well, it's nice to learn some, some specific lower back stuff if you're having lower back stiffness and achiness that may help. Now, is it a cure? Well, no, because if I had a cure, everybody would receive it and no one would have back stiffness. But it is a way to manage it. I think we're a lot more comfortable managing something long-term if we know what it is and know what to do to improve it. I'd much rather do 10 minutes of stretching every day than pursue a surgery. 
Okay. Feel okay? Cool. Anything I should be aware about? Yeah. Okay. So first one's called lumbar rotations. Anybody heard of it? Yeah, so lumbar rotation is just where you drop your knees to the side and you... So caveats to this are you want to go until you feel a stretch on the other side. And since it's not a muscle stretch, we don't need to hold it. Motion is lotion, so we need to do more of a rhythmic movement. So one second here, one second there. And you just let gravity take you as far as you feel comfortable. Don't force it. We need to listen to our body. And what I tell people if they have discomfort is that we always flirt with the discomfort. We never move past it. So we want to nudge it, nudge your body in the right direction, but more is not better. Right? If it hurts or it's uncomfortable, your body's going to guard. It's going to have a negative event. And so I want to flirt with it. And nine times out of 10, people are like, oh yeah, I'm loosening it up as we go. So I usually start my sessions with good hands-on work, mobility exercises, and then we follow up some good strengthening because that's what's been shown to help. Feeling good? Mm -hmm. Lumbar rotations, very fundamental. You can find it a million places, very nice. But the caveats are important. So some people are like, oh, I've tried this before or I've tried therapy before. I'm like, yes, absolutely. But there are a million ways to do the same thing. So we're gonna level up here because she's doing really well. What was your name again? Demi. Demi, nice to meet you, Demi. And so she's gonna cross her right knee. Oh, anything there? Anything hurt? No, oh, I'm good. If I can feel pull, then and it's good. Good pull? Yeah. Oh, okay. Pull. Okay, so since she crossed her right leg over left, you're gonna have more of a lever arm because there's more weight farther away from her back. And now she's gonna rock this way. And you're gonna feel a little stronger pull in the back and the hips. It's just a way to level it up. So I always progress. We want to move you towards that life that you want. So we have to progress. We cannot do the same thing over and over again. That's insanity, right? Same thing over and over again when expecting the same results. Okay. So we don't need to go far as far left or far to the right because now we're stretching more of the right side of the back. There's just two, two classic examples that I use. Anybody have any other good low back stretches they like to do or mobility exercises? I can add a little caveat in there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Who was a chiropractor used to say that every morning before you get out of bed, you do like knee to chest type of thing. Yep. Um, stretch it out before you even try to get out of bed. Yeah, it's the same thing, right? You're working out some of that stiffness and that inflammation that's been sitting around, and you do a little knees to chest, a good pull, and you may feel it in your hip or your lower back. Absolutely. I'm, I'm very, I very much like that. I think we need to warm up our body a little bit. So that's another one. Anybody else? Yeah. Relaxing your arms and your head and let that sort of weight gently slowly down. Yes, yeah. So, for, yeah, so forward flexion with a little movement. Yep. It's a little bit more of an aggressive one. You get a good pull everywhere. That's one I usually work up to if, they're having, if you're having difficulties, especially bending over. Like if bending over is like, Michael, I can't bend over and pick something up, then I definitely work into that. Another one I like to do is a cat cow. Anybody? No, a cat cow, right? Yoga. Yeah, exactly. So I do. So yoga is really good in that it gives you a lot of range of motion, and it gives you a tiny bit of strength, but it teaches your body to move into some other directions. Mm -hmm. I like yoga. I do a lot of yoga in my practice. So child's pose or prayer pose with cat camel. It's all worked into there. Every bit of it. Sound good? How'd that feel? Good. Yeah. Do you want to do the other side? Loosen the other one up. So you cross the left left leg over comfortable and mm -hmm. you just hang you just go mm -hmm. you kind of let gravity take you so mobility exercises are important stretching is like lengthening a muscle or trying to mobility is improving how your joints move and we do have a machine in the other room mm -hmm. that you can put your feet up and inversion table mm -hmm. you go upside down no oh okay mm -hmm. just your legs go up yeah it goes like this, and you put your foot in there, and you can control the delivery mm. of the handle. Mm. Yeah, so, so you don't need that. You have great <laughs> hamstrings. <laughs> you have great hamstrings. But you can do both of them. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, as I say, there's, there's probably a few of us in here that don't have that much range of motion, and that's okay. But that's just your body. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, if you go there and use that, that, you know... Maybe. Well, yeah. Well, over time, yet yeah, you would. Yeah, I, I think, I think the only way, only place where I vary is that we want to be intentional in what we're doing. So everybody's package and what they do in the morning, there may be some crossover person to person, but it should be individualized to your body. 
And that's, that's like why having a good physical exam is important in how you look, because if you're like, I tried this and it didn't work, well, you may be really good at hamstrings already, and you're doing this every day because you're really good at it, but is it necessarily giving your body the love and the nudge in the right direction that it needs? We want to do things we're good at, right? It feels good to do things we're good at, but we also want to work into the areas that we're a little less good at or a little um, less comfortable because that's where we grow. Mm -hmm. Growth is super uncomfortable. Yeah, because I'd rather sit like this in that machine for 20 minutes than jog for 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and they both have two very in different intentions yeah. and outcomes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But we avoid the things that we should work on. I think it's human nature yeah. to go path yeah. of least resistance. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you're right. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, you're Debbie. Welcome. What about stretching on the neck? Because, mm -hmm. you know, you see some people that, you know, do this, and I've heard that's mm. No, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Especially just like popping the joint, there's nothing wrong with that. It hasn't been shown to prove arthritis, get, or cause arthritis. Mm -hmm. Or when you have it, I mean. Yeah, it's good to move it. Mm -hmm. So down in any direction. Yeah, I would say your, your body will tell you. You're not going to move your neck in a range of motion that is harmful because your body won't let you. Now, someone else doing it to you, that's a, you know, that requires a little more training, a little bit more awareness, but even then, still relatively harmless. So if you're like, man, I do this every day and a little crackle. I mean, classic, like it sounds like you have gravel in your neck when you do this type of thing. It's very normal. Yeah, very normal. So I, when I work with clients, I always, I always lead off by saying, no one knows your body better than you. Don't let me tell you what you're feeling, because that's not fair. You're feeling what you're feeling, and you know your body. You've been living with your body so long, you know it in and out. So I, I just help you fill in those gaps in what the literature is showing and what has been shown to be effective, and I just fill in those gaps for you. But I never force you into a direction you're not comfortable in. I see a lot of advertisements, you know, you go to Costco and you have this big uh, display on impact type massage Yeah, 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 yeah. Proper use, value, I guess. Yeah. What's your opinion? Yeah, so the massage guns, um, they're very relaxing. So you have certain uh, sensory receptors in your body that respond well to vibration and physical touch. And so that's why massages feel good. And when we hurt somewhere, we always want to rub it because we have those receptors that say that's a feel good, so your body craves it. So the massage gun can help. Um, general rule of thumb is I tell people massage gun is gonna hurt if you put it over bone, right? So if you're working on it and you hit a bone, it's like, whoa, yeah, like, don't do that. But the direction in which you do it, the length and width, it's a, there's a little variety here and there, but it's fairly safe, okay. fairly safe. I've got one, I use it with clients. It feels good and it saves my hands, so why not? Thank you, Debbie. And so my personal bias is that you got to put together your team, right? And so there isn't one individual that's going to say, I can get you better now and keep you better forever, right? You should have a good per, uh, PCP. You should have someone that's going to manage you conservatively when you need it, PT, massage, Cairo. Um, and then you want to try to get your diet and nutrition at least be somewhat aware, right? That's not saying eat salads all day, every day, but that is saying that some good education on reducing systemic inflammation can be valuable. So there's some really good documentaries out there. Dr. Esther in the area is really good at that. But I think when you're dealing with discomfort, that tends to be a little bit more tricky to manage. Um, and going for a more holistic approach can be very effective. So my, that's my personal bias. So a good PCP that's gonna spend time with you and listen to you. I like working with direct primary care providers in the area, if you guys have ever heard that. There's, it's growing, right? I, and so on my YouTube channel, I've done interviews with three of them now. Um, and then I um, always have a close relationship with them because I like working with those clients because they value their health. Mm -hmm. oh, that's a gross generalization and, and bias, of course. But um, direct primary care provider, anybody knows what that is? It's where you pay a small monthly fee and you get unlimited access to your provider. But when you call, you talk to them, you email them, you text them. Um, Mm -hmm. else, you know, yeah. Uh, you actually, they they work for their. The exactly. Patient. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, they're interested in improvement. Yeah, because the better you get, you'll stay with them, yeah. right? So it's a little bit more. Um, you're incentivized to get people better, which is good, right? That's good. And just like what I do, right? I, I'm incentivized that people get better. They work with me. 
Okay, once again, just talking about organizations. Um, yeah. I think it's fair to say that there's a number of us that are using Medicare. As well yeah, as yeah, as well. yeah. Some of us are um, also have VA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you work with those groups as mm -hmm. well? Mm -hmm. okay. Yep, yep. So, um, you know, I, I have what's called a hybrid practice model. So I'm in network with some insurances, out of network with others because of what I like to do with my clients. But the outcome is very different. So if you're looking for, like, you know, it's just um, all things in life, you can tell what's a good product and not a good product. And some things are worth spending money on and some things are not. It's just all about what you care about, what your interests are in. So it's different for person to person. Mm -hmm. But like those direct primary care providers talking about, they are out of network with all of those. You have to opt out in order to do that. But it's just really good. There's a lot of transparency. There is no more of like calling the office and talking to the medical assistant and maybe the message is getting to your doctor. That doesn't happen, right? Not a call back in three days, a call back in hours, that type of thing. They don't pay me to say that. I only say that because I've seen it many, many times. Okay, so I think when you're really want, kind of like, okay, I want to be there, but how do I get there? I think it's a mind shift change at first, like recognizing that you're in control of your health. And if you want to be that person, then we need to start acting like that person and the things that we do and the foods that we eat and how we take care of our body. Now, you just have to be ready for that change as well. And I, I'm there to help people make that change and make sure that it's easier than they think it is. But how do you see yourself? Do you want to see yourself... Um, do, you, do you really want to stack every card in your favor you can to be resilient and vulnerable later on in life? That's really what it's about. And it's hard sometimes to hear that for me because I am still a younger adult and I haven't necessarily had the same experiences as you guys have had. But I like to think I have a little bit of a leg up because I see it and I treat it all day, every day. So how I do things a little bit differently is that I help, I help people put together their team if they need it because I hear frustrations all the time. Like I call my doctor to send this result over there, but it didn't happen, X, Y, Z. And so I just help like, okay, I can remove some of that frustration for you. Um, but I do a prevention. So I do a good physical exam to look at your nerve health, your reflexes. Um, anybody here have had physical therapy before? I'm sure, right? You have a, you have a good physical exam. It takes time. 30, 40 minutes of a good physical exam to see your strength, your balance, your cardiovascular health, et cetera, et cetera. That's worth keeping an eye on. I tell people, you go to your dentist every six months. Why don't you take care of your body? At least making sure someone has an eye on that. Blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera. If you're having some sort of discomfort, we really dial in on that area, right? I look grossly, but then we really dial in on your back, your hip, your knee. Okay, like what is going on here structurally to the best, um, uh, to the best uh, of our ability to you know, medical, medical system as a practice. So sometimes we use tests and measures to help figure it out, but I'm not gonna necessarily recommend imaging right away. You guys all know that stuff. So, um, and then we learn about your pain, right? Education is very important. So the more you know, the better off you are. And that information needs to be relevant for your body. So you can read all the Google you want, but that doesn't necessarily apply to you. And then figuring out what's best for your body in that moment. Wait and see approach. Our body does very well healing. How many times have you hurt yourself in your life and time has healed it? Do we need to give it a little TLC or love, a little bit of an intervention? Or do we need something more? Maybe we need to go see this person or do that person. And then I had mentioned to John earlier too when him and I were talking that if it's warranted and you want me to, I also go with you to your ortho appointment to help bridge that gap a little bit. You're like, oh, what are you doing? We're like, well, I'm doing a little bit of this or that. I'm like, okay, so I'll, I'll tell him or her what we're doing. And then figuring out that next best step for you, that, is, that decision is focused around you. And that's how it should be. It's me working on someone's neck, doing a little uh, treating headaches. And so if you guys are interested, um, and I, I have your email, so what I'll do is I'll send out a follow-up email. But if you guys want to be a part of, I have a, um, an online self-paced arthritis and degeneration course that has a handout on um, mobility exercises, walking, cardiovascular recommendations, strengthening, and a calendar to kind of break it up when to do it. And then I also answer some of those common questions like, do I need an MRI? What does my MRI show? Will arthritis and degeneration get worse? Will I just degenerate to nothing? What do I do if I have bone on bone? Those are all questions that I answer in some videos. But those are questions that I answer every day. So I just put it together in a little package that um, some people find it as a good place to start. 
right? There isn't a one size fits all, but having some relevant information that I've seen in the clinic and in the literature could be, can sometimes fill in some gaps and just provide some clarity. There's an example of what it looks like. All of this stuff you see here on the right is our downloadable handouts, mobility, what we went over here, just some more of that. Strengthening, I even go through a little advanced lower back exercises in there as well. Self-paced, it's all on your own. There's no, um, yeah, there's, there's just no cost or anything. Okay, so to review today, I feel that we did well having a better understanding of what arthritis and degeneration is. Maybe some common treatments of the healthcare system that have done really well for some and not well for others, but really where we should start. And then how do we live stronger and more resilient lives despite that stuff that's going on? A mind shift change, kind of understanding your pain and knowing what TLC, what routine, what time do I need to put in my body to have the results that I'm looking for. So my challenge to you guys would be, it's not too late to start something new and you can always take care of your body one step at a time. And it's not, we have to address all these areas at first, we just start somewhere. But I've never had anybody be worse off because they're stronger, more resilient, have better balance and better cardiovascular health. If you look at basically any pathology out there, diet and exercise is the number one treatment, number two treatment for almost everything. Almost everything. From dementia to Parkinson's to um, cardiovascular stuff to pain. It's up there. So I just help bridge those gaps that are specific to you. And that's what I love to do. It is time, it is effort, right? But it is worth it. It's absolutely worth it. And I've seen a lot of people have really, really good results. And so many aha moments. They're like, oh man, probably should have done this 10 years ago. And there's no blame. I'm not passing blame anywhere. Like, it's hard. We take the path of resistance, of least resistance first. But then it becomes a time that we need to dedicate that time and energy. And that may be now, that may be five years into now, that may have been 10 years ago. So I really appreciate you guys giving me the time, by the way. I love talking about this stuff. I'm very much, I'm, I'm going to stay, stay around for a moment to answer questions and, and meet and greet or whatever you guys want to do. Um, but I really, really appreciate it. Here's the references that I used. And then there's some ways to connect with me, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube channel. And I try to put out a blog um, a couple times a month answering those high level questions for you guys as well. And I'm also open to any type of feedback. And so from today or questions in the future, my email's on my card, michael at revisionhealthservices.com. So what questions do you guys have? Uh, yeah, go. One quick, quick one. Um, one of the benefits of being in the more senior part of life yeah, yeah. being retired is the ability to travel. Mm -hmm. um, so you get into, you know, it's really easier here because I get into routine. I go to the, the Y like three yep. times a week. I'll come over here awesome. and exercise here. Yeah. Um, you can walk, you got people you talk to. Yeah. You get on vacation and that all goes out the window. Yeah, yeah. Um, suggestions, references on how to kind of keep the mm -hmm. exercise routines going on when you're in a different environment. Yeah, well, I think one, if you, if you want to, that's different, you know, like if you're like, oh man, I want to do this, but I just can't, then you're gonna be more motivated to do it. But then also if you're like, I'm on vacation, I don't want to do anything. Well, that's well-deserved too, I can see that. Um, I would say your body's not biased to what you have going on in your life, right? So you, you still need to take care of it. So there's people, I've done it many times where I'm like, okay, so you're getting out of your element for a, eight week cruise. I'm like, good for you. You're going on that cruise, but you still need to take care of your body. You're going to take your bands with you. We're going to have a couple workout routines that you're going to do, or you're going to be doing some classes that they offer. And so it's different for every situation, but bands are a great way to do it. I just posted a few videos on my YouTube channel about how to use bands and how to strengthen your body with just a space like this using yeah. bands. And that's a great way to at least maintain. You're not going to make huge leaps, but you're going to maintain. And so I usually recommend bands and you can work your heart anywhere, shape or place. Like there's a way to, there's tons of ways to do that. But we find what works for you. Like, okay, your back's a little stiff, so we're gonna give that some TLC or your hips a little stiff, we're gonna give that some TLC. And so it's, it's individualized, but it can absolutely be done. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, what about dry needling? Yeah, so I do dry needling. You do? Yeah, yeah. Um, dry needling is really good. It's good for trigger points. 
And so trigger point in dry needling is that you have a tight band of tissue, right? Most people are like my neck. Like I got this tight band in my neck and sometimes I have headaches and sometimes I have some radiating discomfort. It can be very good to target those areas, very specific towards it. It's used as an acupuncture needle, but the, the way that you do it is differently. It's a little more aggressive, so you are sore. Um, there's really to no harm to it, um, but it is always followed by stretching and strengthening though, and that's how you get the long-term change. I was not familiar with that until maybe about six, eight months ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's relatively newer. Um, I did it in Illinois way before Florida even allowed it. Okay. Yeah. So you do do it? Yep, yep. Question back. Uh, yeah, I've been on a plant-based diet for mostly plant-based diet for about 10 years. Amazing. Now, and it's yeah. helped me tremendously. A yeah. lot of things that, that I've read that speak of arthritis and bones and yeah. things like calcium absorption <coughs> is that um, from plants, we absorb calcium a lot better, like dark greens, broccoli, okay. and things like that, than we do from dairy products. However, I still see dairy products recommended. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And people coming up with bone density problems and yeah, stuff yeah. like that, even though they're having plenty of dairy products. Yeah. So is this like out in left field? Or no. is this like, you know, how does the regular medical community feel about this? Yeah. Um, well, that's driven by dairy industry and a lot of money um, in that they make a lot more money off of cow milk than they would almond milk. But almond milk is way more dense in calcium than cow's milk. But you just don't hear that. And so those decisions are based off of dairy industry and making a ton of money off of that. And agriculture is not great for the environment and it's not as nutrient filled. There's a lot of issues with that. Um, but the medical community would generally agree, like I spoke with my uh, pediatrician, with my son, right? He's 15 months old and he's still um, nursing and that's fine, but they said he needs to be on cow's milk. Or if he's not nursing, he's be on cow's milk. But then now they've changed it more towards, you can be on almond milk, it's fine. It's just as, you know, it needs to be more nutrient dense. There's, it needs certain minerals and vitamins and fats because he's a child, but they've shifted their language then, like they're not necessarily recommending cow's milk first. And so the change is happening over time, but the more educated to be, there's great documentaries on Netflix that talk a lot about that as well. Um, but there's a reason why I don't necessarily treat a lot of plant-based and vegetarians um, because they're just not having issues. And if they are, it's, it's, it, they're a lot, they bounce back a lot faster. Now, I try to lean more towards that diet. I would say I'm more plant-based-ish, but on the weekends I definitely enjoy my other stuff. You know, I'm, I, uh, I, I, you know, I, like I said, I don't like to swing to one side of the fence all the time, um, but I think we have some room to grow. But the medical community is very, very understanding. I mean, you can't lie. The data can't lie. It doesn't lie. But it's driven by. Covered up. That's right. Yeah, it's it's driven by you know people who have a lot more money to be like. You know, they can drive those decisions. But a great documentary was Game Changers on Netflix where it talked about Arnold Schwarzenegger and how he used to be like, eat a T-bone steak every day to maintain oh, that yeah. protein level. But now he's like plant-based, you know? And so like people can change, your body can change, but even just having one more plant green filled mil meal has great effects on your body, just one. So you're not, you don't have to necessarily do it all the time every day. If you do, great. But what I'm saying is like when people get a little apprehensive because they're like, I got to change everything. Like one small change at a time. That's a great place to start. I'm on board though. I'm there's, on. There's, I'm unfortunate that I, I get the benefit of Jean having oh, okay. been plant-based. So now I am. Oh, day. very good. And um, I don't think people realize uh, the quality and the variety. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And enjoy it, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, there, there's some fallacies that have been on. No, it's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's lots of... It's, it's more work, right? You, it's, a little, it's a little harder because you can't go to Wendy's. You At know. first it is because you yeah. don't know how to do it. Well, yeah, and... Yeah. Yeah, and... Yeah, and it's a lot easier to think of all the things you're missing out on. It's so... But, but you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to be because... Yeah. 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 
I love it. I mean, th these are conversations that they were not that were not being had 20 years ago. And so even this small amount of change is good. Well, you just cut out the process in food. Yeah. What they used to have a really great salad bar. Who? Oh, yeah, yeah. But then they changed that, but that, that was one of the good things. Well, yeah, it's a lot harder to keep fresh food fresh, right? You can freeze a burger. And it's easy. Well, I really appreciate all of your guys' time. I'm going to stick around for a moment. Thank you guys so much for just listening. I really appreciate it.